This video is going to show how to compute a confidence interval and do a hypothesis test using R when you have a small data set. So we need an example. Let's look at Siegel 914. This problem gets carried on in chapter 10 as uh, problem number 9. So we have a bakery that produces loaves of bread with one pound written on the label. We also have a sample of the loaves that were produced today, we're asked to find a 95% confidence interval. The chapter 10 question uh, asks us to do a hypothesis test in addition to that. So let's, um, let's start with the thing we're trying to estimate. So the thing that we're trying to estimate, the reason we're doing this is to find mu, which is equal to the true mean weight of all loaves produced today. So our, our universe is all the loaves that we produce today. We could do a census and no mu, but you know, perhaps we don't have resources to do that. Therefore, we've drawn this little sample. The null hypothesis is going to be that mu equals 1, and the alternative is that mu does not equal 1. All right. Now, now that we've uh, stated our null and alternative, remember we, we, we shouldn't data snoop. We should always um, you know, state the null and alternative before we, we uh, do anything with the data set. Let's go over to R, and we can uh, simply copy all this, and I'm going to make a new da uh, data set called bread, and I can just paste this in. So now I've got my data. Now the first thing to notice about this is it's a very small data set. So whenever we have small data sets, we should probably look at um, the data, make sure that there are no outliers. Um, we also must have normality since the sample is so small. We, ca we can't use the central limit theorem uh, with, with a sample this small. If we're going to do a t-test, we need normality. So there's a number of ways that we can look at this. If I do a histogram of bread, um, the histogram is not very good with small data sets. There's a couple observations out here that really might be out in the tail. It looks a little bit strange, but the histogram is not the best diagnostic for this. Um, likewise, we could run a box plot. It looks like the tail might be a little bit right skewed. The right tail might be a bit long, but it's hard to tell. Now we've gone over some Additional diagnostics, the QQ norm plot uh, and the QQ line is, is another way of evaluating normality, which is can be a bit better with these small sample sizes. So the fact that all the points fall on the line indicate that it's reasonable to assume a norm, normal distribution. We've got one point out here that I'm a little bit concerned about, but um, it, it's looking fairly normal. Now we could do the Shapiro test as well. The null hypothesis of this test is that the data are normal. In this case, the p-value is about 0 0.6. 0 0.6 is much, much larger than 5%, indicating that we cannot reject the null hypothesis of normality. Therefore, um, I'm going to assume normality, which means I can do a t-test. All right, let's, um, let's do this the easy way first, and then I'm going to show um, where that easy way comes from. So the easiest way to do this is with a function in R called t-test. So if you type t-test bread, and if you're doing a hypothesis test, you need to give the reference value. So the reference value in this case is 1, coming from our statement of the null and alternative. If you omit that, then the p-value could be a little bit goofy, but you'll still get the confidence interval. All right, so here is the confidence interval. Um, the uh, p-value is shown up here, and we can see that it's borderline significant. So I should probably state the conclusion. So p-value, the p-value is 0 0.068, which is a bit greater than 5%. So we cannot reject the null. Um, although the 
you know, I, I should indicate that the, the, the value is borderline significant. Um, you know, so it's, it's, it's around that 5% cutoff, but it's, you know, not quite under it. Had we, um, had we done a one-sided test, this would have been barely significant. The p-value would have been half of that, but um, not with a two-sided test. This conclusion also follows from the 95% confidence interval. So note that 1, the reference value, is in 0.998 comma 1.045. So we cannot rule out the value 1. So one's a possibility. All right. Now, let's just see where some of these numbers come from. So if we find the length of bread, this gives us n. So our n is 12. Then um, we can find the standard deviation of bread with the sd function. So sd bread gives us the value of s, so the sample standard deviation. Dividing this by the standard, by the um, uh, square root of the sample size, so the square root of 12, gives us the standard error. So I'm just going to put a little comment out here to us that this is the standard error. All right, now remember a 95% confidence interval is just the mean plus or minus uh, some t value times that standard error. So the t value is going to be determined with QT. I'm going to use 0.975 for a 95% confidence interval. That leaves 2.5% in the right tail, 2.5% in the left tail, 95% uh, in the middle. And if I um, take n minus 1, so I'm just going to write 11. Where does 11 come from? Well, it's 12 minus 1. That's my t value, so 2.2 something or other. So if we take now, and I'll actually find the confidence interval. I'm going to take that t value times the, uh, oops, wrong, wrong one. Here's the standard error. So if we take the t value times that, we'll get our margin of error. And then if I were to take the mean of bread, and then if you want plus or minus to c minus 1 comma 1, times that. This will give me the 95% confidence interval, which should match what we had up here. And sure enough, it does. Now, where does this T statistic come from? Well, remember, uh, you know, it's really just uh, that, that formula that we used to find Z statistics earlier. So, uh, x bar minus the mean over the standard error in this case. So I'm going to bring back the standard error. So this is this is what it will be in our denominator. So I'm going to write that. Maybe I should have defined that as the standard error. Now if I take the mean, which is mean of bread, minus the assumed mean, which is 1. That was That's the value in our null hypothesis. And we divide by that we get 2.021, 2.0213, 2 2.0213, and that's it. All right, where, where does the um, uh, exact p-value come from? Well, if I take 1 minus pt, so this is going to be the cumulative t distribution of that big thing with 11 degrees of freedom, that should give me one tail, which should be about 3.4%. And sure enough, that's what it is. If we multiply this by 2, you get that p-value. So I guess my advice is do a couple problems like this by hand just to make sure you know where all the numbers are coming from. And then after that, always use the t-test function. All right, that's it.